Hello and welcome to ONS Energy Talks. My name is Mike Henry and I am Communication Director in ONS. Today we will be talking about how the spreading of the coronavirus is affecting energy markets and uh, not least the future impact on the oil and gas industry. Today's guest is uh, Jaran Rista. He's the founder and CNO of uh, Rista Energy. Welcome, Jaran. Thank you. So first question, how are things with you these days? Different days than normal, I guess. It's, it's very different than normal. Uh, and uh, the entire company is working from home. Uh, and, um, and clearly, uh, we have never ex experienced anything else like uh, everybody else. In terms of business, of course, uh, we, we look at energy markets and guide uh, companies how to relate, uh, how to behave in the energy markets. And basically, every forecast made more than three, four weeks ago is completely outdated. Everything has changed. So in that sense, uh, we, there's a lot of work for us to do to update all these market perspectives. Also to support companies on how to behave through this crisis. How can they cut costs, uh, but still maintain the business momentum? Uh, and finally also, uh, quite some clients are looking for opportunities in this downturn. Because the prices you have currently for companies, for example, uh, and that is uh, it's, uh, much better than you will have uh, when this crisis is over, of course. So also, if you have deep pockets, you can take opportunities in this crisis. Uh, so all of this is things we are working on. And of course, understanding the oil market uh, so that also people that, are, uh, that live directly from the oil price will understand uh, how this will develop. And also for uh, the renewable markets and gas markets, we see big changes, even if the oil market is a big change. So we are doing our best to generate new business and to live here. But clearly, I think that we will not either be immune, immune in, in, uh, against this, this virus as a company, because mm -hmm. also many companies, says, they tell us that, well, we want to do this project, but we have got from the top management the message that we will stop all projects. So I think also this could happen to us. So we are prepared to also uh, look at this, but so far actually business has been quite well uh, despite this very, very special situation. Yeah, no, that's good to hear, Jaron. And, and um, speaking of, of business, in, in 2004, you founded uh, Riesta Energy. You're offering energy related analysis and services, and you have, uh, have very many big clients and then famous uh, companies and, and um, various customers but recently you you kind of changed your way from from looking at just energy markets to publishing a report on the coronavirus and how this impacts the, yeah. the global energy markets can you can you explain this journey <laughs> how you went from, from yeah, yeah many people might be, uh, be surprised to see that we actually have been building up a big database on the coronavirus but of course our clients are interested in understanding how long will this virus situation last and how deep will the impact be? And we couldn't find that kind of information off the shelf. Uh, so we had to do the analysis ourselves. And it's quite meaningful actually, because uh, many of the same uh, mathematical models we are using to model the oil market, for example, we can actually use also to model the spread of the corona coronavirus. So that is exactly what we're doing. And we're publishing a weekly report on this. And we have also published dashboards and we are especially also looking at the number of true cases, not only the reported cases, uh, because this is the most giving the best predictions for what will happen going forward. Uh, so I try to basically use the big data approach, to gathering every single piece of information I can get about this and try to understand uh, how this will develop in the different countries. Uh, and of course, we will use this to understand what will happen with the energy markets. And, and can you elaborate a little bit about your findings in, in this report? So you say that you update it every week, so I guess you just have a, a, a recent update. Yes, we just have a new report today, actually. Well, no, we say that uh, the number of true cases infected globally is about 13 million. Uh, and currently we see that all countries globally have put in place very strict quarantine measures. And already we see that uh, the peak of the, of the pandemic in many countries 
is actually rich in terms of number of uh, fatalities, for example, new fatalities per dead. It's, it's flattening out, but if it was not for the quarantine measure, it will continue to grow exponentially. So we see that this is happening in Spain and Italy and in France, for example, while other uh, countries like the United States is still uh, on a trajectory uh, upwards. So the quarantine measures are working. But the key question is, of course, how long will this last? And we think that a responsible approach for the government, you would like to keep the uh, number of infected people as a share par uh, as a part of the population below a level that you still have uh, intensive bed care units uh, available for all the people that need that. And that is approximately 0.5% of, of the population. And to do that in a responsible manner, you will need to actually manage the virus such that you have the infection in the population up to 12 to 18 months, depending on how far this, uh, how, uh, uh, how, how big, uh, how large ICU capacity you have, you know, the intensive uh, care units, that, uh, that the capacity you have. So how does this, these numbers, you, you mentioned 13 million, uh, how does this differ from, from the official um, global numbers? Uh, approximately 5% of all the true cases are reported as cases. So most people look, of course, at, at, the true, uh, at reported cases. And, uh, and they are, in some, many countries, they are actually saying more about the reporting uh, technologies that the different countries have rather than the underlying real number of infected people. Hmm. So, and to get to this number, we look at especially fatalities and we look at ICU beds in use. And with these two numbers, we can, through different indirect measures, calculate how many people is actually infected. Right. Fascinating how you're using the same kind of tools to, to, to look at this, uh, of course, very tragic, uh, very, very, um, horrible coronavirus spreading, but we're also looking at the uh, how this this affects the global energy markets. Can you say a little bit about uh, about this part of the report? Yes, yes. Well, clearly, uh, oil is used to move people around in the world, either by airplanes or by cars, primarily or cruise ships. And the whole point with the current uh, campaigns from governments is to stop people from moving around in the world. Uh, so clearly then this will affect uh, the oil demand because uh, basically we will stop doing all, all the things we, are, we used to do uh, when we are burning oil. So we see that the oil demand could drop uh, 20, maybe 25 million barrels per day. Uh, we are monitoring of the traffic in all the big cities, uh, globally more than 1500 uh, cities. And we see that traffic is already down approximately, uh, it's actually 42% on average globally, if you are weighted by the population. Uh, and uh, it could, done, could go further down actually. So uh, meaning that half of the oil that is used to, for cars and uh, even more for aviation is taken away from the market. Um, and the question is how long will this last? Is it, we, we think that April will be a very deep is deep cut scene, even if you see some starting to growing demand again in, in China. Uh, but also this could last for much longer, as I said. But I think also that we will learn how to live with the virus and maybe get a little bit more back to, to normal activity again. So we have uh, assumed that the oil cuts will not be that big for, uh, for every month uh, this year. Right, okay. Also, one of your key points in this report is, is that governments face um, um, a very tough balancing, balancing act between public health and economic impacts. Um, yeah. How do you see this balance from today's measures? No, I just uh, acknowledge that the governments have a lot of tough decisions. Of course, being in Norway, we have a very generous government with very deep pockets and uh, that, that can take measures to stop the virus and still support businesses to at least uh, having a, a less uh, devastating impact uh, for this. And many other places they don't have that. And actually I got the first reports that people in quarantine have been running off the money and uh, are actually out uh, stealing from some shops. We have seen actually some parts of Southern Italy and some other places 
And we have got reports that people are starting to, to, to run into to shops and to basically take whatever they need. So this is just a, a certain kind of early warning that this could have a quite uh, problematic impact in many places. And this is, of course, one of the, the balancing acts that the governments need to, 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 to take. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And um, you're a very busy man nowadays, Jaron. and I've seen you uh, featuring in in uh, various uh, broadcasts and uh, news articles. And um, and some days ago, you said on on the Norwegian Channel TV two that uh, the market is flooded by oil as well now. Um, yeah. Can you explain what's happening to the oil markets nowadays? Well. Usually the oil market balance is uh, for the last one or two million barrels of oil. And for example, OPEC could influence the oil price from uh, taking away 500,000 barrels uh, or one million barrels from the market. Uh, so this is normal situation. Currently, we're talking about uh, 40 or 20 to 40 times higher uh, uh, volumes than that. So it wouldn't actually matter what OPEC is doing, or whether OPEC and, and uh, Russia uh, uh, need, uh, or reach an agreement of cutting one or two million barrels, it would hardly impact, it would hardly be visible in the market. So what is going to happen is that we physically will run out of storage capacity, and that we had to shut in wells um, that are, uh, even if the NPV of these wells you know, uh, is positive, the cash flow might be negative, but NPV might be positive, still, we need to shut in because we cannot find anyone to store, to take that oil and to store it. And that's why oil price will just continue to drop and drop and drop until these volumes are forced to actually be, be shut in. The first place is maybe some landlocked areas in Canada and US and maybe some places in Russia and some other places where the local demand is taken away and they cannot uh, find enough local storage. But then I think this will spread also globally. So for a short period, you can get extremely low prices uh, until you find a new uh, equilibrium on these uh, very low volumes. And then your oil price will actually come back up again uh, somewhat uh, to, uh, to, to levels that are kind of economical sound for the producers. What kind uh, of numbers so, are we yeah. talking about, Jaron? Sorry? What, what kind of numbers are we talking about, Jaron? Now, I, I said oil price could go to $10 and it, and, and it can even go below. And actually, already now we have uh, some reports from some parts in Canada where oil has been given away. So, uh, so uh, because basically you have oil in the pipelines or in the trucks and you just need to get, get rid of it. Uh, uh, so, but of course, this will only be very, very small volumes that will be traded on that kind of levels. Uh, so, but uh, we are, we, so I think average for them. For a year, we, we, we still we might see, see um, figures below um, or, or around $20. But this is kind of, this is volumes that still will make a profit, uh, at least on the margin, you know, a cash, cash flow profit or a positive cash flow, I mean, for, for the companies. Uh, so, um, it, yeah, could be prices we have never seen before, actually. Mm. But you mentioned also it's going to come back up again. So uh, are you looking at any... What's your best estimate for that one? <laughs> yeah, of course. Now we are drilling very few new wells. Uh, every, all the activity we actually are doing in the oil market today uh, is usually um, the oil that will come into the market in 18 to uh, months to seven years into the future. So we, actually a lot of this cut of activity is not harming the current market, but the market that we see down the road um, uh, 18 to 24 months from now. Mm -hmm. So let's say that we are successfully combating the virus and, and get, get finished with the virus in, let's say, uh, 18 months. Oil demand will then come back up again. Maybe with some structural changes, but still it's very likely to, 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 uh, to regain most of the volumes lost. And then suddenly we are running out of oil. Uh, and a lot of uh, value chains uh, will be broken, you know, uh, suppliers will have been, have gone away, etc. And then suddenly everybody wants oil and cannot get the, get hold of it. And, and, and then the oil market will turn. Uh, so then oil prices can go as high as you can think about, actually. Mm. So, so for many people, I think it's, it's kind of difficult to understand how this um, 
how this oil markets, um, oil prices and oil markets are kind of linked together with the coronavirus. You mentioned um, a, a big drop in in, uh, in the use of oil, of course, uh, people are traveling less, etc. But but you also mentioned OPEC. So so many people are also talking about two crises, two parallel crises. Um, yeah. Can you explain that how this is interlinked? Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, of course. Uh, it's partly connected, partly to different things, because uh, from uh, for the last years, it's been a pain for OPEC to watch uh, United States just growing and growing in oil, taking market shares. So the first thing they did was to try to get the Russia on board uh, so that they had to at least share the pain with Russia if they wanted to stabilize the market. Uh, but next now is that, uh, so the rev is quite clear, we want to try to stabilize the market, but we don't want to do it alone. We insist that others should join us to stabilize the market. And uh, um, Russia, you are the most important one to join us in this. And they spent what, two years to reach an agreement. Uh, finally, they did it uh, in uh, 2016. Uh, and no, <clears throat> this, this has been increasing tension for this cooperation. So I expected that actually that cooperation would not last. Uh, so that was exactly what happened uh, in the start of, of March. And at that time, that was relevant because then uh, another or one and a half or two million barrels of oversupply was the visibility we had. So OPEC decision was relevant and we get a perfect storm of a positive supply shock and a negative demand uh, shock at the same time, oil price collapsed. But what has happened for the last three weeks is has almost made OPEC uh, uh, irrelevant. Uh, to the oil market. I mean, if they announce now a cut of 5 million barrels, would that save the oil market? No, not even close to it. And you don't need OPEC now because now physical uh, dynamics in the market will force some producers to close down uh, completely uh, regardless of any kind of, of uh, political decision to stabilize the market. So uh, in one way, OPEC is, is quite irrelevant now. But that so there's a there's a uh, a war on on oil price. But who's who's winning this war? Actually, is anyone winning? <laughs> well, the the players that will have new oil coming to the market in 2022, and that can now purchase services to prepare for that oil for very low prices, they will be winners. So uh, so uh, it, it's a timing effect, like it is in any kind of commodity. Uh, business actually with very cyclical markets, so the 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 the, the right timers will be the winners, but uh, and also the people that take opportunity to to do uh, business. Uh, I mean to to buy businesses in this downturn also will be winners in the long term. Right, and how how long could we see this one running? No, as I mentioned already, I think. Uh, to responsible uh, manage through the virus without uh, exceeding the ICU capacities in the different countries. Mm -hmm. You have to actually, the precise numbers is that if you have 10 beds per 100,000, you need uh, 12 months. If you have five beds per 100,000 available, um, uh, then I'm talking about intensive care uh, beds, then you need 18 months. Mm -hmm. So I think it will be a battle between uh, this responsible policy and um, introduction of uh, vaccination or other medicines uh, or technologies. And, and I think we could think about technologies, you know, with some kind of virus spread technologies on, on the iPhone, etc. that could make it the, uh, possible for us to, in a responsible manner, manage interaction so that we can also stop the virus from spreading. What's or, uh, as I said, we can get the vaccination or, or, or medicines, uh, and then this will stop it much, much uh, earlier than in 18 months. But if that doesn't happen, then we could, could, uh, could last until well into 2021. Right. But what kind of iPhone technology? Could you, could you explain a little bit more about what you mean with that one? Yeah, I think actually both uh, South Korea and uh, Norway has done some experimentation with this. And of course, iPhones now uh, have a very precise position data. And um, if you're then able to track exactly who have you been close to over the last uh, hours and days, uh, it's possible for iPhone 
to backtrack where you have been in a contaminated kind of situation. Uh, and then you can give, get some kind of immediate warning, you know, that uh, the contact you had uh, this and this uh, long t days ago, it's suspicious. So, and all your contacts will then be uh, also sus suspicious. So then you can basically make some kind of a a a analyzing the spread of the virus and then put up some kind of red flag and then you have to do a certain kind of behavior uh, if you get uh, into a certain kind of category. So this, this is, I think, uh, the, the thought set uh, that uh, exists around this. Mm. Moving uh, over to, to uh, closer markets or, or back home to, to Norway, where we both are based, um, many are, are worried now that the Norwegian oil and gas um, industry or oil sector will once again put on their brakes. What yeah. do you uh, expect will happen to, to the Norwegian uh, industry in this round? Yes, uh, of course it it will. Uh, I mean, I think oil companies, many oil companies, will actually survive, and uh, they also have uh, hedged financial hedges uh, for the, the oil volumes. So, which is a good a good floor uh, for the oil companies, and also actually the the government is likely to still have positive cash uh, from the from the oil industry, even if the oil price goes down to the lower twenties on average. And so it's the oil service that is uh, the, the hardest hit uh, sector, I think. So uh, because the demand for the services will be down, well, 50%, 80%, whatever. Uh, so uh, and it, already in all non-essential maintenance, for example, or, or activities on the platforms is, is taken away because People uh, want as few people as possible on the platforms to avoid the uh, contamination on the platforms. Um, so, so as I said clearly, oil service will just find a way to survive without spending money and then be ready to run when the market is back up again in 18, 24, 36 months. Mm. So uh, very difficult if you have a, a debt burden, etc. So of course we might see restructuring or, or, or things happening. But clearly, it's not you know uh, it's not a structural change that is what is happening. You know that the, the, this demand will be away forever. We will have at least one big new wave of oil industry bef before the energy uh, transition is taking over, uh, and the oil will peak. Uh, but all of that is more ten years down the road. So so uh, um, so it, it's still fundamental demand for these services, just not in the ne next uh, tw twelve uh, to eighteen months. So we're just putting on the brakes, really, just uh, just waiting it out. Yeah, um, yeah, that, that's interesting. But and that kind of leads me over to my next question as well. But it, will this kind of be uh, a boost for uh, renewable energy? Can we see that some things will happen to to the renewable sector now that perhaps the oil and gas sector needs to put on the brakes? Yeah, uh, honestly, I I don't think so. Uh, that uh, because. Uh, Renewables, it was already a boost for, for renewable. And uh, until four weeks ago, that was what everybody talked about. So the structural changes that is needed, of course, that we need new technologies, uh, meaning that we need to deploy all these new wind farms and solar panels and all of that, and storage technologies. This is what is going to, to create the energy transition and, and the new zero carbon energy society that I'm convinced that we will get uh, within three decades. So this is going to happen in any case, but the uh, effect of this crisis is, uh, uh, I think, rather that some of this uh, structural change will be put on hold for a while uh, because people don't have uh, the technologies and the project capacities to follow up uh, the construction of these uh, new renewable uh, wind uh, farms, etc. So it, we will see some uh, delays in that rather than this being speed up. And I think the, uh, the kind of the mindset change has already happened and that will not go back. So people will still start to focus on this and, and maybe more, you know, to when they see how volatile the oil market can be. So it could have some effect in that sense. But, uh, but I think already, uh, but, but what we see now is that uh, due to the currency, uh, very strong dollar, uh, and uh, also from other places from uh, that people are buying from China, and they have very weak local currencies. We see actually some of these projects 
being much more expensive than anticipated. And also this is slowing down a little bit the, the deployment of, of some of these new renewable technologies. Right. So we're, uh, we're all in one big uh, quarantine, more like people are working from home and, and uh, we're putting... Exactly. And it's very, dif yeah, very difficult to travel to follow up on, on a construction site, whether it's in Korea or other places, you know, and that will slow down the project. Yeah, definitely. Do you, do you see any any effects on that already, slowing down on investments and projects, etc.? Yes, yes, we see that. Uh, uh, many projects have already announced uh, postpone or, or delays uh, due to lack of people or lack of some key equipment. Uh, but I think it's much more to come that is not yet visible. So uh, uh, projects will be is slow down uh, when you don't have a uh, proactive follow-up from the management and from, uh, from project managers that are representing the kind of the buyer of the project. Hmm. And I guess the big question for everyone is, as you has mentioned uh, many times in, in this talk as well, is how long is this going to last and uh, what's going to happen afterwards? So do we just put a, put on the press the, the, the pedal again and just start uh, speeding ahead or will there be any any deeper yeah. structural implications yeah yeah no well i think people in the start hoped that well this could last for two or three weeks and then we are back in, back up again and then i said now look to china they spent actually 10 weeks to to get rid of the virus in wuhan so that is maybe the perspective and i still uh, and i think that still many people are there this will take two to three months and then we're back to normal but I don't think so, honestly. I think it could take, as I've already said many times, 12 to 18 months. Mm. Mm. And so then, then, of course, then, then, then we have to redeploy, uh, re-employ the people. Then there's a lot of things to be done that also will slow down uh, the recovery, uh, uh, or, or at least to, and uh, getting back to normal situation it will, will not be done just overnight. No, definitely. So what are you guys doing in, in Rista Energy to manage the situation? You mentioned a couple of things. You're working from home. You have a lot to do. Are you doing anything else? Well, we are trying to have, uh, you know, we have a more frequent uh, joint company meetings. We are uh, trying to have a webinar, uh, a lot of webinars. Uh, we are having uh, virtual roadshows. We're trying to basically use uh, use the alternative communication uh, as much as possible uh, to still be, uh, and we are trying to develop new products and tools uh, so that we are still relevant for our clients uh, uh, in analyzing this very, very special situation. Mm. Yep, virtual roadshows. That that sounds interesting. What's that? Well, we we uh, are putting up a campaign that we have a special special topic. Let's say that could be. Uh, 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 the rig market uh, in, in 2020 and 2021, which is, of course, very, very special. And then we are preparing some very updated recent slides on that, and then uh, maybe calling uh, top uh, or, or all the key players in the industry uh, on that topic uh, and uh, set up conversations with the top management, typically, uh, of these companies and share these perspectives. And hopefully we, we then think that maybe this, this will generate some business opportunities for us. Uh, after that. Very fascinating how we all uh, kind of just uh, changed our ways uh, during this crisis and uh, everyone starts to to think very creatively about how we do uh, business and how to survive. Mm. Well, um, Jaram, this brings us to an end. Um, thank you so much for talking to us today and uh, for everyone watching. Thank you for tuning in to ONS Energy Talks. Watch us every Tuesday and Thursday at two o'clock live on Facebook. So stay safe and take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.